This is News at 8. Hello there, welcome to the Primetime Bulletin here on Joy News on Multi TV, also on ABN TV on the Sky platform across Europe. My name is Gifty Amdorpia. Making the headlines tonight, Chairman of the Opposition New Patriotic Party promises to be neutral in the party's flag bearership contest for the 2016 election, cautioning flag bearer aspirants to seize the media spectacle and join in efforts to reorganize it. We continue the expose on the sad Sada story as former chief executive says the authority could not ascertain whether Asantaba Cottage Industry paid any money into the Guinea Power joint venture. We also find out how easy or difficult it is to assess renal dialysis treatment in Ghana's premier hospital. In business, cement prices remain the same as distributors and sellers of the building material await the anticipated announcement for reduction. And on the foreign front, confirmed death toll from the South Korean ferry that capsized last week has reached 113 as divers recovered more bodies from the sunken hull. We have all these plus showbiz sports coming up. Please stay with me. Now to the details, newly elected chairman of the opposition New Patriotic Party, Paul Afoko, says he would be neutral in the party's flag bearership contest for the 2016 election. In his maiden press briefing on Tuesday, Paul Afoko said he would not countenance infighting among aspirants ahead of the party's congress. The press briefing was delayed for close to three hours to enable executives of the party to arrive at the venue. Paula Foko, who campaigned actively for flag bearer hopeful Alan Chermantin during the party's 2008 Congress, played down widespread perception that he would support a faction against the other during the upcoming Congress. The 2016 general election is crucially important to the Ghanaian people. From my extensive travels around the country, I have become aware that Ghanaians are waiting for the NPP. We cannot afford to fail them. It is for this reason that I think we cannot and should not allow narrow and parochial selfish interests to get in the way. No member of the past executive was present at the meeting, though Polafoko says that was insignificant to his call for a united front for the party. As chairman and leader, I want to reiterate my promise to the party and especially to future contestants for the flag bearership contest. And that promise is that I will remain neutral in the contest. I will also urge the other executives to do the same. We shall be honest brokers, unifiers, and committed to the party, and with the support of all members and sympathizers of this great party, we will work to carry this party into government. The NPP is supposed to elect a flag bearer two years ahead of the 2016 polls, according to the party's constitution. Now on to our expose. Former Chief Executive of Savannah Accelerator Development Authority, Gilbert Edi, says the Savannah Accelerator Authority could not ascertain whether Asantaba Cottage Industry paid any money into the Guinea Fowl joint venture. Sada claims it, it entered into a joint venture with Asantaba Cottage Industry, an exchange program to produce and market Guinea fowls. But Gilbert Edi, who left office almost a year after the joint venture company was formed, says he does not know whether Asantaba contributed any amount. Manasa Zurewini reports. In 2012, Sada entered into a joint venture with Asuntaba Cottage Industry, an exchange program to commercialize the production of guinea fowls. The joint venture company formed as a result was named Sada Asuntaba Guinea Fowl Production and Marketing Company Limited. According to information at the Registrar General's Department, the two directors of the company are former CEO of Sada, Gilbert Sidu Idi, who represented Sada, while Roland Agambiri, CEO of the Agams Group, represented Asuntaba. Records at the Registrar General's Department also indicate that Sada contributed 12 million Ghana cities to the joint venture, 
while Asungtaba contributed 15 million Ghana cities. For this reason, Asungtaba is the majority shareholder of 56% shares, while Sada owns minority shares of 44%. But Gilbert Idi says Sada contributed a total of 15 million Ghana cities to the joint venture. To the 50 million that was paid, 3 million of it was actually for mobilization of outgrowers, supporting those uh, facilities that the outgrowers need, which a company may not have been interested because the company will want to go into direct production. But we are insisting that instead of using the resources to go into direct production, you must use outgrowers. So the cost of using the outgrowers was to be borne by a separate fund, which was $3 million. So Sade's actual contribution as a equity was $12 million. Gilbert Idi was Sade's CEO at the time the joint venture was entered into. He remained Sade's CEO for almost a year afterwards, but he says he does not know whether Suntaba paid their contribution of the 50 million Ghana cities. You are aware of the amount of money Sada paid into this joint venture? Yes. The total being 50 million. Exactly, I know that one. But you don't know how much Asuntaba paid? Asuntaba was to pay 50 million, but they are not to pay Did they to pay? Uh -huh. Did they pay the 50 million? Not to me. Not to you, I know not to you. Uh -huh. The 50 million Sada paid was not paid to you. It was not paid into your account. It was not paid into Sada account, but you are aware. You see, what would have happened is that at the board meeting, this question that you are asking can be relevant, at the SADA board meeting, the SADA board could have invited its representative on that company's board of directors to answer this question. Are you not part but, of the SADA board? Were you not part of it? I know, but that question didn't come up. And nobody in the SADA board tried to find out whether Suntaba really paid or not? But the board hasn't really sat down to discuss at the time that I was there, you know, the issue, let's see, there was a time when there was a schedule for the representatives on Asuntaba to come and brief the board. But something went wrong and that thing didn't happen. According to the rollout plan of the company, commercial guinea fowl production was supposed to have started last year. But when Joy News visited the northern region and the upper west region, the structures for the guinea fowl production were still under construction. The contractors had left the sites at the time of our visits. The only complete structure was the Upper East region. This structure was already in existence before the joint venture company came into being. It was owned and operated by Asuntaba before the company entered into a joint venture with Sada. Our investigation, however, revealed that the company was paid by Jida to train 2,000 youth in Guinea rearing. The company was paid over 1,700,000 Ghana cities, but it did not train any youth. Attempts to get Asuntaba to respond whether or not they contributed any amount to the joint venture with Sada have failed. For Joy News, Manasi Azore Arene reporting. The sad, sad story there. It was to continue. But about 200 vehicles with DV number plates have been impounded by an operational team of the Ashanti Regional Police Command. Owners of the vehicles are said to have violated the Road Traffic Act 2004, Act 683, and Road Traffic Regulations 1974. DCOP Nathan Kofi Bwache told journalists in Kumasi the action was to constitutionally enforce the rules and regulation of the National Road Safety Commission. A report by Mahmoud Mohamed Nuruddin. Under Section 50, Clause B of the Road Traffic Act, DV number plate cars are unauthorized to carry passengers or goods for hire or reward. The use of the trade license for funerals, weddings, carrying children to and from school, consistent usage by vehicle owners outside business hours, between the hours of 6 a.m. and 7 p.m., among others, is also an offense under the law. Ashanti Regional Police Commander DCOP Kofi Bwache warned vehicle owners in the region to obey the law to avoid being arrested by the police and subsequently charged with an offense. He promised the regional command would effectively enforce the law. DCOP Kofi Bwache read the part of the law to the vehicle owners and gave copies to them. No person shall, and this one is not me, no person shall use a train license for the purpose not authorized by this regulation. And also under any of the following circumstances, when the Washada Kase, who to be for trade plate and yet the Ebeke King, one, funerals. So you cannot buy use trade plate to funerals. Two, weddings. 
three carrying children to and from school. It is a two old women can say, uh, Captain Mimar goes school, I am prohibited. Four carrying family, relatives, friends, or any other person. Five, I'm a here, man. Consistently placed straight lines on the same vehicle, like a registered number to be used daily by owners, friends, and relations. Among the culprits were some military men, police officers, immigration officers, businessmen, and public servants. Some vehicle owners who were ignorant about the law said they would immediately license their cars and educate their colleagues about the regulation. The vehicle owners were, however, freed without charge with a police warning letter and a promise to license their cars as soon as possible. Mahmoud Mohammed Nuruddin's report from the Ashanti region. Let's do some health now. Ghana will soon introduce the malaria vaccine to help eradicate infant mortality. This is according to the expanded program on immunizations program manager, Dr. George Bonswe. He was speaking at the fourth African Vaccination Week in Ghana. Immunization is widely recognized as one of the most successful and cost-effective health interventions, preventing between two and three million deaths annually through immunization. Children under five are spared the wrath of death from diseases such as whooping cough, diphtheria, tetanus, and polio. But malaria remains a leading cause of infant deaths. A standard program on immunization manager, Dr. George Bonsu, however, says the malaria vaccine will soon be introduced in Ghana. It's on trial, and as and when, I mean, it becomes available, and, 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 and uh, it's, it's, pro it's proven and, 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 and uh, authorized for use. Ghana will definitely into malaria vaccine because malaria is a major child killer actually in this country. And there, are, there are a lot of sites actually on the African continent, and, and one site is Kintampo in Ghana. So, and, and they have done a lot of studies, and there's very, all hope and potential that the vaccine will license for use in the very near future. So Ghana, I have no doubt, will be one of the countries which will actually uh, pioneer the use of malaria vaccine because once it's been I mean, cleared for use I mean, uh, in the country. National Child Health Coordinator Dr. Isabella Segomosis, who was also speaking at the fourth African Vaccination Week, said it has been proven that two million infant deaths have been prevented globally just by putting new babies to breast within the first hour after birth. She cautioned mothers to desist from unhealthy delivery practices that can cause preventable deaths. I was sadly shocked a few months ago when someone doing a survey here in Accra found mothers who are applying all kinds of things, rub, pepsodents, um, and herbs and others to the court. These are some of the reasons why a child would die. In fact, if the court is left alone without applying anything at all, it's better than putting some of these harmful material. So clean court care, and then early postnatal um, visits. Within the first week of delivery, we recommend two visits to the health facility. The goal of the African Vaccination Week is to strengthen immunization programs in the African sub-region by increasing awareness of vaccine preventable diseases. Still with health, hitherto kidney diseases and transplantation was unavailable in Ghana and one had to travel outside the country to receive treatment. Due to advancement of technology, renal dialysis is now available to patients here in Ghana. But how easy or difficult is it to access this facility? Iman Alante has the rest of the story. This young lady, Theresa, was found unconscious at the unit five months ago and was diagnosed with kidney failure. But for the compassion of the unit staff, the SHS3 student would have lost her life because she cannot afford the cost of the treatment. In Ghana, initial laboratory investigations and medications per each session of dialysis cost about 190 Ghana cities, which is very expensive for the average Ghanaian. This means, even though the technology to treat the disease is available, it is not easily accessible to the average Ghanaian. Reports say most patients who need this treatment badly are low-income earners and are breadwinners of their families as well. 
Therefore, their need to survive by paying for hemodialysis sessions might compromise the finances of their families. The main problem, I think, is chronic dialysis, where the person's kidneys have failed completely and they have to be on a machine or get a kidney transplant. Facilities are available for dialysis. We can work you up for a kidney transplant, but the issue is money. You need to pay 190 Ghana cities at each visit to be able to have your blood cleaned of the urine that is stuck in your body. And that excludes three times a week. Three times a week. So that is 190 Ghana cities three times a week. And that is supposed to be the minimum treatment. Dr. Osapo also explained why the treatment is expensive. We don't reuse any of our staff. All the consumables come from Germany, from outside. So we have to use hard currency to buy these things. And that is why the dialysis costs so much. So if you have the money, then you can assess. But the difficulty is that the kind of people who get the disease are not in a position to get money for the treatment. That is the worry. Transplant is about almost about 100,000, 60, for now we are charging 60,000 Ghana CDs to have a kidney transplant done. And that does not include the donor who is willing, who has given the kidney willingly. It's not like the person is selling the kidney and the cost of the kidney is part of it, no. This is having the surgery and also having treatment because at the end of the surgery, your body needs to be informed. The unit was made for 10 people, but now houses 200 patients putting pressure on the facility. According to the acting CEO of the hospital, there are plans to expand the facility. But this requires a lot of financial support from benevolent organizations and the general public at large to make the treatment more affordable. Emmanuel Ante, Joy News, Accra. Meanwhile, the Ghana Revenue Authority, as part of its social responsibility, has donated 10,000 Ghana cities to the renal dialysis unit of the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. The acting chief executive of the hospital urged all well-wishing Ghanaians and other benevolent organizations to come to the aid of the nation's premier hospital to save more lives. Presenting the 10,000 Ghana cities check to the renal unit, the assistant commissioner of the Ghana Revenue Authority revealed how beneficial the unit has been to the staff of GRA. Our mission here is to make a small donation to the, the Kidney Foundation for the support they have been giving us. Um, we may not be able to repay all that you have done for us. This is our widow's might. And I am here on behalf of the Commissioner General. She also assured the unit of GRA's continued support in the coming years. That Kolibu needs everybody's help because Kolibu is not just for sick patients. I mean, you may be very healthy, but your wife may need our ups and gyne. Your old lady may also need uh, some of our units. I mean, if you are not there in person, God, thank God, but maybe your relative as a result of age or some circumstance, unpredictable, unexpected, may become a patient at Kolibu. So it behooves all of us to try and fix Kolibu. The acting CEO of Kolibu on his part expressed gratitude to the authority and urged the general public to emulate GRA's example. They were also given a tour of the facility to appreciate the challenges the unit faces. You're watching the Primetime Bulletin here on Joy News on Multi TV and also on ABN TV across Europe. We'll take a quick breather. When we return, we we'll tell you about uh, cement prices because I'm sure that you are so interested. You're welcome back, many thanks for staying. Now let's go to the presidency because President John Mahama has urged politicians to emulate older generations of politicians to instill discipline in the practice. The president was paying tribute to a former Ghanaian ambassador to Germany and first lawyer from the northern region, Roland Isifu al Hassan, when his family uh, called on him, on President Mahama at the Flagstaff House, to formally announce his death. General Joshua Hamidu led the family 
to present cola to the president as tradition demands before announcing the demise of their father. He was not just the first lawyer from the north. He was not an individual who uh, thought of himself alone. He always thought of Ghana first. The people of Kumbung and Lagong will be most delighted <laughs> to see you yourself or a delegation from you at the funeral, which comes on on the 27th of this month. As you know, Your Excellency, um, the Muslims don't dilly-dally with death. And we haven't, haven't buried him and done the third day. We are now going to do the most Islamic prayers next Sunday, the 27th. His Excellency al Hassan was a member of parliament during the reign of Ghana's first president, Osaji for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, in 1964, he relocated to Tamale to practice law after the 1966 coup d'etat. He later became a member of parliament for Tolong and at the Popular Front Party. President Mahama said those were times when respect for each other was not compromised in politics, calling for those times to be revisited. Apart from being among the first generation of educated people, they took part in the independence uh, struggle. They were involved in the early politics, both pre-colonial and post-colonial. The very significant thing about them, which I believe that those of us following in their footsteps should learn is that even though they might have shared different political ideologies, they treated each other with respect and they were close to each other and um, it was very different from the current political environment that we have, you know, where if you belong to different political parties, then you consider yourself enemies or opponents and treat each other with disrespect and insults and all that. I guess that if we emulate what our fathers did, I mean, the politics of this country will be more decent and dignified than we currently have. I want to assure you that government would be very well represented at the funeral. Uh, my wife also lost her sister and the funeral is just the day before uh, Uncle Arai's funeral, but if it is possible, I'll do whatever I can to be there. But if not, definitely government will be very, very well represented. Ariel Hassan, who was awarded Order of the Volta in 2007 by former President Kufo, died after a short illness at the 37 military hospital. He is survived by a wife and six children. The final funeral rites will be held on 27th of April. 2014. Kiftian Rapia, Joy News, Flagstaff House. Now away from the capital, help is yet to come for over 1,000 displaced residents of a rainstorm that wrecked havoc in Dabuya in the North Gonja district of the northern region. A heavy downpour accompanied by strong winds on Sunday ripped off roofs of buildings and flattened many more structures, including school buildings. The roofs of more than 100 houses and 28 classroom blocks in five busy schools in the district were ripped off completely. The torrential rain also left four mosques and houses of police officers and the district police station roofless. Electrical appliances, foodstuffs and clothing of residents were also destroyed in a rainstorm. Affected residents who have been rendered homeless are still putting up with family members, friends, while some schools have become a new home for others. They are appealing for assistance from the National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO. <laughs> Okay. And she's saying that they were in the room at about 4 o'clock. They had their uh, roofing sheets going off. So they gathered all the children at one place. And now they don't have a place to lay down their heads. All their things have spoiled. Their food items and uh, some of their clothing were gone. But North Gonja District NADMO coordinator Constance Abiba al Hassan tells Joy News that they are overwhelmed at the extent of devastation of the rainstorm and can only rely on their central office in Accra for support. 
The district NADMU coordinator cannot do anything here unless we write to Tamale. And that's why we are compiling all the things because we are a new district and we don't have anything in stock so unless we see the, nas the uh, national. So we called Tamale and they said we should bring the reports today so that it will be sent to Tamale. So we are looking on to NADMU in Accra so that they can help us with uh, zinc and cement because some of the houses fell. District Chief Executive for North Gonja, Saku Yahuza, has admitted that the district assembly alone cannot support the victims and is appealing to central government and other non-governmental organizations to come to the aid of the displaced residents. Yeah, national headquarters. Considering what is at hand, it would be practically impossible for the district assembly to be able to mobilize resources to support the affected victims. So we would want to, to, to make a passionate appeal to the government and to civil society organizations, non-governmental organizations, well-meaning Ghanaians, philanthropists, to, the, to come to the aid of the North Gonja district assembly. The Traders at Wenchi in the Bonahafu region have pledged to support the municipal assembly to rid the area of unauthorized structures and hawkers causing nuisance. The traders made the pledge at a social accountability forum dubbed town hall meeting organized by the assembly at Wenchi. Nesta Kafui Ajuma sat through the meeting for Joy News. The Social Accountability Forum or Town Hall Meeting is designed to discuss wide range of issues and also keep the people abreast with development trends within each MMDA. It is also aimed at cultivating the spirit of transparency and accountability in order to promote good governance at the local level. Social accountability is also one of the fundamental requirements for assessing the District Development Fund and Urban Development Grant, which are major sources of funding for MMDAs. As a fulfillment of this obligation, the Wenchi Municipal Assembly organized a town hall meeting for the first quarter of 2014. Heads of departments, traders, artisans, various identifiable groups among others attended to air their concerns. In his presentation, the Municipal Chief Executive for Winchi, Haki Budauda, said the Assembly will continue to run a transparent and accountable administration in a bid to develop the municipality. He noted that the most challenging issue to the Assembly is the dwindling revenue inflows, especially from their internal sources. The MCE stressed that the Assembly is reactivating the revenue tax force to plug the loopholes in the system. He added that revenue collectors who fail to meet their target will have to make up the difference or have their salaries suspended. Haki Budauda bemoaned the proliferation of unauthorized structures, especially at reserved areas. He hinted that his administration is taking immediate steps to purge the town of illegal structures. We intend to reactivate our revenue task force plus the loopholes in the system. We have also increasingly challenged by the creation of unauthorized structures in all corners of the town. This unhealthy development marks of indiscipline on the part of developers for which we have taken immediate action to perish the town of illegal structures, especially. Some of the participants asked the assembly to reshape roads leading to farming communities in order to make cotton farm produce easier and cheaper. They also asked the assembly to ensure that water flows every day instead of the current three to four days interval. Nesta Kafuya Jamais reports from the Bonafo region. Well, the District Assembly's Common Fund is the major source of funding for most of the assemblies, especially those in the deprived district, because 
of their inability to raise their own funds to execute projects. The district chief executive of Fort Nkwanta South was therefore disappointed that they are yet to receive the fourth and first quarter of 2013 and 2014 funds. The situation, he said, is really affecting development in the district. This was contained in a sessional address delivered on his behalf by the district coordinating director, Al Hassan Yusuf. The district has also over the years been faced with lack of potable water. On course to eradicate this menace, he announced that hydrological studies, drilling and construction of 15 boreholes in 15 selected communities are currently underway. He added that other communities will follow suit in the provision of clean drinking water to the people as well as eradicate waterborne diseases. The district chief executive said under his leadership, the assembly will use all channels possible to make sure a favorable environment for socioeconomic activities in the district is created through development. He also stated that the year under review witnessed the construction of three unit classroom blocks at Dawakura DA Primary, Blacky Junction DA Primary, and Ibrubrua JHS. According to him, all the buildings are ready for use but yet to be commissioned. He added that the fund from the district's development fund has been channeled towards the reshaping of Nyambong, Kechebi, Alupacha. Abriwanko and Gikrong feeder roads. The chief executive reiterated government's commitment to the completion of the Eastern Corridor roads. He said the assembly's new mechanisms of generating funds has within the first quarter of 2014 collected 35,029 Ghana cities, representing 30% for its target of 2014. <laughs> Comlado's report for Joy News. When we return, it's business time. Please stay. So there are quite a number of issues making rounds in the world of business and of course I'm here to update you. My name is Abigail Adoma Quinchi. First of discussions for a new daily minimum wage for workers in the public sector resumed today. Talks on the daily wage had stalled over the past weeks due to fears that government might not be able to meet the demands of organized labor. However, a source close to organized labor say they have been able to secure government's commitment to resume the negotiations. The source also asked that they would be able to meet the May 1 deadline for finalizing the new daily minimum wage despite concerns by some workers. Some persons following the negotiations are worried that the discussions are not moving as planned since the minimum wage should have been finalized by now to pave way for the base pay and the public sector wage negotiations. However, from that cement prices remain the same as distributors and sellers of the building material and its products wait on government to, put, to reduce prices as promised. They are, however, hopeful the reduction will take effect from Wednesday, tomorrow, April 23. The retail price of cement is expected to reduce by up to 5% effective April 22 following government's discussion with some major manufacturers. The price of the product had shot up steadily in recent months, largely due to the rising cost of production. But dealers say they are still waiting on government to formally publish the retail prices to inform the rate of reduction. When the news team checked on Tuesday afternoon, a bag of cement still sells between 23 and 25 cities depending on the brand. For brickmakers, although they have no indication of the reduction, it will not have any impact on their pricing. We are buying that same price, 25 Ghana cities per bag. Are we going to see a reduction in the prices of your bricks if there's a reduction in the price of cement? We haven't increased it since the prices went up. It's still the same, so we'll maintain the same price. 
However, distributor of gas and products, Emilia Asamoah, maintains they have been authorized to reduce their prices from 25 cities to 24 cities effective Wednesday, April 23. The gas and people has reduced the price a little bit. So we, the sellers, too, we have to reduce the price a little so people may buy it so maybe today there we haven't make any sales so maybe tomorrow going the price will become 24 for retailers the cement price reduction comes as good news but insists the hitherto increasing price trend of the product affects their businesses negatively So this is to clear the air on the VAT to be charged on banking services and the Finance Ministry and the Ghana Revenue uh, Authority say contrary to some media reports, salary savings, deposits, loans and payment with checks are all exempted from the new 17.5% VAT charged on banking services. In a statement released on Tuesday, April 22, 2014, that's today, and signed by the Deputy Finance Minister Casey Latoforsing, both institutions made it clear that the new VAT will only affect the non-core financial services such as data processing, legal, accounting, actuarial, notary and consulting services. According to them, the VAT Act 870 is not new and has been in place since 1998 and requires the banks to register for VAT and pay VAT on the inputs they use to render their services. The statement also indicated that the impact of the VAT is not the full 17.5% as speculated since VAT registered businesses can also offset the input VAT against their output VAT. So that's for your information there. Away from that, there are renewed calls for telecom companies to bring down their data charges to get more people to use Internet on their phones. The National Communications Authority's latest report shows that mobile data subscription in the country increased by only 3.34% in February compared to the 20.2% increase in the previous month of January. Telecoms analysts are, however, are blaming the drastic fall largely on customers concerns about data pricing and service. They tell Joy Business the trend would continue until telcos improve their charges and services. Even though the con country is inching close to the 50% mark in data penetration, analysts believe it can be achieved if infrastructure is improved. And that will be all for business. We'll surely keep you updated on all the issues that we have raised here. My name is Abigail Adma Quintry. Sports is up next. Let's begin sports tonight with some tennis news. An intense competition marked the first day of the McDonald Tennis Open at the Cross Stadium as the week-long championship witness qualifiers in the men's division. The tournament, which is sponsored by McDonald Shipping, will see top guns alongside the nation's number one, George Darko, compete in the second round tomorrow at the same venue. CEO of McDonald Shipping, Daniel McCauley, has been assessed in day one of the championship. It's always said that a, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a step. Uh, this is a step in the right direction. The guys are um, highly, you know, psyched up. They are, are willing to win um, the ultimate prize, and uh, they are playing to the best of their abilities. But we can say that uh, there's been uh, lacking games. They've not been. They've not had opportunity to play tournaments like this. So some of them are a little bit jittery, and uh, they are not living. Uh, gradually, they're warming themselves up into the competition. But we're looking forward to see great uh, games ahead. Patriotin has not been really encouraging. Um, they want to use your medium to uh, invite the general public to be here in their numbers day two, come tomorrow, so that at least they can give the guys their needed support. Um, uh, all tennis loving fans should be here to witness this um, uh, uh, beginning. Uh, in the near future, this is going to be grand. This is going to be mega. And we need all to be part of this great uh, beginning. Now we can talk about the story that's been trending all day in soccer and Manchester United 
manager David Moyes had been sacked only 10 months after succeeding Sir Alex Ferguson. His dismissal was announced after a meeting, an executive meeting, really this morning, and he was actually asked to leave the club after training. Let's do some showbiz. Now the silent rivalry between Ghana's two leading female movie makers, Leila Jansi and Shelley from Paul Mansell, seems to have received an interesting twist during the premiere of Shelley's latest production, Love, or something like that. Here's more. The movie Love or Something Like That, which features multiple award-winning Ghanaian actor John Dumelo, Jocelyn Dumas, and a host of talented actors, tells an emotional story about a young surgeon. She reunites with her ex-boyfriend and as a result throws her world into absolute chaos when she makes a horrible discovery about her past and what could be the end of a great career and a beautiful marriage. Concerning reports making rounds that there is a silent rivalry between the two renowned filmmakers, Shelley Frimpon Manso and Leila Jansi, there is very little one can lay hands on. But after recently picking an award for a role he played in Leila Jansi's movie, it came as a surprise when John Dumelo admitted openly to Shelley's assertion that his role in Love or something like that was his best yet. John then went ahead to add the following. Um, I just want to say... There is Hollywood, there's Bollywood, and then there's Shelley Kipoma, so making Africa proud. Well, I refrain from commenting on John's statement, but we are watching closely. That's it for showbiz. Showbiz.